the most thrilling season of the year is Christmas. And in some ways, this should be one of the best Christmas seasons that Americans have spent in many years. It's certainly been one of the best we've ever had. To have members of our own family here and our team family and Johnny and June Cash, what a Christmas season this has been for us. But this past year, we've visited a number of countries throughout the world preaching the gospel. And in many of the places that we visited, we sensed that some sort of crisis threatens the very foundations of their societies. Thus, as we celebrate Christmas, ominous clouds are gathering on the horizon in many parts of the world that could affect the whole world, including your world and mine. In addition, I'm speaking to many of you tonight who have your own personal crisis. It could be in your home, your health, your work, or just the pressures of life itself. But in the midst of all these problems, there comes the message of Christmas. With all of its hope, its goodwill, and its cheer. I think the message of Christmas has been generally misunderstood and misapplied. Some think only of business profits, shopping, gifts, tinsel, toys, and celebrations. Others think only of Bethlehem, of the star in the sky, shepherds in the field, and angels singing. And still others cynically ask, where is the Prince of Peace? But the real Christmas message goes much deeper. It answers all the great questions that plague the human race at this or any other hour. The Christmas message is relevant, revolutionary, and reassuring in a world of confusion and crisis. It can be summed up in three tremendous events, a birth, a death, and the climax of human history. First, the birth. On that first Christmas night, the Bible tells of the angel who said to the fearful shepherds, as we read a few minutes ago, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. What is the real meaning of these good tidings? During various wars, many a mother tries to keep in memory of her young son's father fresh on the boy's mind. I heard of one during World War II who took her young son into the bedroom every day and they would stand and gaze at a large portrait of the father who was away at war. And one day the young boy looked long and wistfully at his father's picture and said to his mother, Mom, wouldn't it be great if Dad would just step down from the frame? For centuries, men had looked into the heavens, longing for God to step out of the frame. At Bethlehem, 2,000 years ago, God did exactly that. He stepped out of the frame. That virgin-born baby was God in human form. He humbled himself. He took the form of a servant. He was made in your likeness and mine. He identified himself with our problems and the problems of the whole human race. Thus it was that the apostle John wrote, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. In the early days of the 19th century, the world was following with fear and trembling the march of Napoleon. Day after day, they waited with impatience for the latest news of the battlefields and of the wars. And all the while in their homes, babies were being born. In just one year, lying midway between the battles of Trafalgar and Waterloo, there came into the world a host of heroes. During that year of 1809, Gladstone was born in Liverpool, Alfred Tennyson was born in Lincolnshire, Oliver Wendell Holmes was born in Massachusetts, Frederick Chopin was born in Warsaw, Felix Mendelssohn was born in Hamburg, and Abraham Lincoln was born in Kentucky. But nobody thought of babies. Everybody was thinking of battles. Yet 168 years later, with a truer perspective which the years enable us to command, we can ask ourselves, which of the battles of 1809 mattered more than the babies of 1809? What a difference the baby born in Bethlehem's manger 2,000 years ago has made in our world. The educational systems he has inspired, the social reforms that his teachings have instituted, and the transformation of families and lives and nations. Secondly, there's a death. Christmas to have meaning cannot be separated from the cross. 
The angel said at the birth of Jesus, he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus himself said, speaking of his death, to this end was I born. The apostle Paul years later said to young Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The central message of Christmas to me is that Jesus Christ by his death and resurrection can transform both individuals and society. Almost everyone at some time or another senses that he's a moral failure and suffers some form of guilt. Almost every newspaper or magazine that we pick up and almost every newscast we watch show hate, lust, greed, prejudice, and corruption manifesting themselves in a thousand ways every day. The fact that we have policemen, jails, and military forces indicates that something is radically wrong with human nature. Every time I board an airplane, they search my luggage, my briefcase, and sometimes even my clothes. Then I'm made aware again of the disease of human nature. You see, man is actually a paradox. On the one hand, there is futility and sin. On the other hand, there's goodness, kindness, gentleness, and love. On the one hand, he's a moral failure, but on the other hand, he has capacities that would relate him to God. No wonder Paul spoke of man's disease as the mystery of iniquity. The Bible teaches that the human race is morally sick. The disease has affected every phase of man's life in society. The Bible calls this disease sin. The Bible teaches that we are sinners and that the only cure for sin is the blood of Christ that was shed on that cross. At this Christmas season, many churches will be celebrating communion. And when we put the wine and the grape juice to our lips, it is a symbol of that blood that was shed. One of the most important aspects of the worship of ancient Judaism was the shedding of blood to make atonement for sin. The word blood symbolized in the Old and the New Testament a life that has been given. Christ became the lamb slain from the foundation of the world for the sins of mankind. The cross and the resurrection stand as man's only hope. It was on Good Friday and Easter that God did for man what man could not do for himself. From these two momentous events, God is saying to sinful man, I love you. But he is also saying, I can forgive you. This is the good news of Christmas. But you must also do something. You must humble yourself and admit your sin and your moral failure. And then by faith turn to him as Lord and Savior. You must say as the publican did, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The scripture says, a broken and a contrite heart God will not despise. This is the good news that the world is morally, psychologically, and spiritually looking for right now. Some of you may dismiss it as ridiculous and idiotic. The Apostle Paul himself said the preaching of the cross is, I know, nonsense to those who are involved in this dying world. But to us who are being saved from that death, it is nothing less than the power of God. We all admit that we need some sweeping social reforms, and in true repentance, we must determine to do something about it. But our greatest need is a change in the heart. That is why Jesus said, you must be born again. That is why he said, unless you repent, you will perish. The Apostle Paul in his famous sermon in Athens said, God now commanded all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Who should repent? Everybody. This is what the cross calls for. The heart of the message of the cross is simple. Repent or perish. It's as simple as that. And it's also the message of Christmas. Thirdly, there's that glorious hope. There is the wonderful climax to human history. We're not wandering aimlessly about. There is hope for us that there's going to be a culmination to history as we know it. There's more to Christmas than the birth and the death of Christ. There's also the ultimate triumph of God's kingdom. 
You know, chiseled into the cornerstone of the United Nations building is a quotation from the Bible that has never yet been fulfilled. It reads like this. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. That's a thrilling hope at this moment of history. It has often been repeated by men who long for peace. However, this quotation must not be taken out of context. The passage speaks of the time when the Messiah will reign over the whole earth. This is the era of which Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This is the time when he who came as a baby at Bethlehem shall come as King of kings and Lord of lords. The Bible teaches that there will be a close to history as we know it. Man will have his last Armageddon. But when it seems that man is about to destroy himself, God will intervene. Christ will return. At his birth, he was in the stall of an animal. At his death, he wore a crown of thorns. But when he comes again, it will be as the commander in chief of the armies of heaven. He will take control of this war-weary world and bring the permanent peace that we strive for and long for. A new world will be formed. A new social order will emerge. In the midst of so much gloom and pessimism in many parts of the world that we've seen this year, or perhaps even in your own heart, we're not to wring our hands. The angel said to the frightened shepherds 2,000 years ago, fear not. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. There's a fairly new gospel song entitled, The King is Coming. I love it. The King is Coming. And when he comes, sin will be eliminated. Tears will be wiped from every eye. Disease shall be no more. And even death, man's greatest enemy, will be eliminated from the human race. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and wars shall be no more. This is the promise of Christmas. This is our hope. This is the Christmas star that lights our evening darkness. This is the assurance that a new day is coming through the Messiah whose name is called by Isaiah the prophet, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. This is God's gift of Christmas. This is the message that I've had the privilege of preaching around the world on every continent. And these my team members have joined me as we've proclaimed it together in song and word to many different cultures. And no matter where we've gone, it's the message of this good news that meets the need of the human heart. Perhaps until now, you've been celebrating this Christmas and every Christmas of your life for the wrong reasons. How many Christmases have come and gone without your ever really knowing Jesus Christ and the gift of new life he brings. I'm going to ask you to do something on this Christmas that we've just seen hundreds of thousands do around the world. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whether you're alone or in a room somewhere or surrounded by your loved ones, I'm asking you, all of you together, even whole families right now, to bow your heads and pray this prayer with me. Oh God, I have sinned against thee. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sins. And by faith, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. And now on behalf of all of us, may this Christmas mark the beginning of a new life for you and your family as you make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. Good night and a blessed Christmas from our house to your house.